everyone, this is Afro-Latina World. Uh, my name is Candice, and today we have a very special treat for you. Uh, we're here uh, discussing with the author of Cuban Literature in the Age of Black Insurrection. His name is Matthew Petway, an uh, assistant professor at the University of South Alabama, whose specialization is in um, Afro-Latin, uh, Caribbean, and Spanish literature. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, having you here with us today, uh, Mr. Petway. I'd love to get into um, into this book with you. Um, but before Thank we you for begin, having me. Thank you for yes, having me. Yes, yes. Um, I'm pretty sure that our community would like to know uh, who your ancestors are in literature. Who are the people mm. who have inspired you uh, as a writer, as a teacher, um, in, in the thing that you do? Well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, uh, from an English-speaking African-American family. My father was born here in Mobile, uh, where I teach, and my mother was born in Detroit. Uh, so I have roots in Tennessee and Alabama and South Carolina, where my grandmother was born. Uh, we're not exactly sure where she was born, if it was uh, Buford, South Carolina, or Sumter. Uh, but the records the records say Sumter, the um, the ar the uh, our archival genealogical records that I've seen. When I think about literary ancestors, I'd have to say that there's so many that, and I've never been asked a question before, <laughs> that I would include both African Americans as well as um, uh, Spanish speaking people from of African descent from the Caribbean. So James Baldwin is definitely someone that I very much identify with uh, because of the critique of white supremacy in his work and the ways in which he was able, he was willing to challenge the system from a particular uh, particular standpoint as an African-American man. I very much identify with the fire next time uh, with notes of a native son. Um, at the same time, uh, I would have to say that uh, uh, there's some Afro-Latino authors like Nicolas Guillén that speaks to me. Nicolas Guillén is really interesting for me and really special in some ways because uh, he lived during the same time as Langston Hughes in the United States. Those two met one another, knew each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, Langston Hughes actually spoke Spanish because his father lived in Mexico and he translated some of Guillen's work. So Guillen was really, for me, at Eastern Michigan University where I did my undergrad, uh, there was a professor named uh, Ili Rico. I like to call his name. He's still with us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ashe. But he introduced us to the Afro-Latino Afro-Latin American world through Nicolas Guillén. At the time when you picked up an anthology, the only name you found of any person of African descent, male or female, was Nicolas Guillén. He was the stand-in. It was like reading an anthology of U.S. literature and only seeing Langston Hughes. It was unbelievable mm -hmm. considering how vast the history is, considering the fact that nine out of ten, more than nine out of ten African men, women, and children that were brought to the Western Hemisphere against their will were brought to Latin America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And that there, and that you had Spanish and Portuguese uh, settlements in the Caribbean before you had them in North America. Uh, it's just un incredible that that was, that was all, he was the only one there. Mm -hmm. And so Guillem was there, his work spoke to me, poems like Mulata, uh, Bucate Plata, which talks about uh, prostitution, uh, Mulata, which talks about self-image and, um, and the question of, of uh, proximity to whiteness, um, mm -hmm. La Balada de los Dos Abuelos. And then in the process of coming to write Cuban literature in the age of Black insurrection, uh, Manzano and Plasto became literary ancestors for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as well as Juana Pastor, who is the first uh, Cuban of African descent to write about Cuba in any significant way. Uh, in 1815, mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. published a series of poems um, called Decimas, which are from, from Iberia, from medieval Iberia, both Portugal and Spain, mm -hmm. uh, that are like uh, 10 verses with uh, lines that, are, that have eight syllables, octosyllabic lines. And she was mm -hmm. dealing with her, uh, based upon, you know, it's very euphemistic, but based upon my reading of her work and my students reading of her work, She's really dealing with her identity as uh, a woman and with questions of uh, uh, reputation, uh, chastity, uh, social expectations for women of African descent. She was a, a teacher of elite women 
he taught Latin to the teacher of an elite mm -hmm. women uh, mm -hmm. in a slave aristocracy. So those, those are some of the literary ancestors. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Definitely uh, what you've touched upon for us or for, for our community seems to be a treasure trove of artistic uh, creation from all over the diaspora. It's, we're just starting with, uh, with these uh, Cuban poets here. Um, I would love for you to uh, introduce us to Manzano and Placido by telling us or setting the stage for us um, about who these men were uh, and what it was that set them apart from other poets at their time in, in yeah. their time and what it was that they were going through at the time. Absolutely. Um, well, Juan Francisco Manzano and Gabriel de la Concepcion Valdez, also known by the pseudonym Placido, are really the most significant, uh, I would say, Cuban writers of the 19th century, uh, African descended Cuban writers of the 19th century, and some of the most consequential Cuban writers uh, writ large because of the political significance of their work. Manzano could be compared to uh, Frederick Douglass, like a Cuban Frederick Douglass, though, though he published his slave narrative in English translation in 1840, mm -hmm. uh, and it was used in Europe to promote the anti-slavery cause, and Douglass didn't publish his first narrative until 1845. I really like for Afro-Latin Americans, Afro-Latinos, and African Americans to know that. Um, that's very significant because it demonstrates that Latin America was already in the process of producing emancipation narratives, though there are very few. There are very few. There's one that we know about by an African man by the name of Bacuacua in, uh, Brazil, uh, who was enslaved in Brazil. And that was published in English in Detroit, my hometown in the 19th century. Uh, I still, uh, want to look into that one more closely. Uh, Placido, uh, was someone who was himself a free man of African descent, somewhat like Martin Delaney in the United States, and Manzano and Placido. Placido became, are, are significant for different reasons. For one, they're writers of African descent. They identified as such. Mm -hmm. um, they produced a literature that uh, had a Catholic, Spanish Catholic surface to it. Uh, but when one begins to do a bit of literary archeology, span she or he begins to realize that beneath the surface, there's a series of symbols uh, that uh, are inconsistent with Catholic orthodoxy, uh, mm -hmm. at least with the church proffered as doctrine, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. consistent with Yoruba and Bakongo mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. of spirituality, those African ideas of spirit and cosmos that I deal with in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also important because they met. These two poets met circa 1839. We don't know the exact year because they both give different years for when they met. Uh, and they're also significant because they collaborated in some fashion. Uh, the full nature of their aesthetic collaboration and its political implications I deal with in chapter six of the book. It's really difficult to kind of uh, pull apart and identify exactly what their collaboration might have looked like, but they argue about a poem w once they are both accused of being part of an anti-slavery movement. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which according to the Spanish government had as its objective, the annihilation of the white race, uh, though that uh, wasn't the objective for mm -hmm. most of the uh, conspirators. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the conspirators were interested in the abolition of slavery and they were interested as well in, uh, in some sort of independence uh, for Cuba, some form of independence for Cuba. Yes, it, it seemed like a really um, interesting time where there, where the institution of slavery was still very much in full force. However, there were free people of African descent um, within Cuban society at that time. And yet also at the same time, Cuba was um, petitioning for its independence um, from the um, Spanish empire. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that correct? So these, these men were creating uh, during a very um, turbulent, very complex time. I'm wondering if you could uh, clarify a little bit of that for us. As, sure, I could talk uh, more about that. I think time. it also, <laughs> I think it also speaks to just how powerful their work was um, at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say that Cuba was petitioning for independence, but there were a series of uprisings in Cuba uh, with the objective of achieving some sort of independence from Spain, and sometimes those uprisings were. Uh, centered around the, the need for the abolition of slavery. So 
Um, Mansano and Palazzo essentially produced literature in the shadow of the Haitian Revolution. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to frame mm -hmm. uh, the works of these two Afro-Cuban or Black Cuban authors without thinking about the Haitian Revolution. So what does, what was the Haitian Revolution? What did it accomplish? Well, it accomplished several things. The Haitian Revolution is the only revolution in the history of the world where enslaved people uh, defeat their oppressors, in this case, the French, um, and establish an independent state of their own, mm -hmm. uh, where the enslaved people were at the helm of the of leadership, en en enslaved and formerly enslaved people at the helm of the, re of the leadership. Figures like Toussaint Louverture, which by that time was formerly enslaved, and Dessalines, who actually had been enslaved in the field, doing field work. Uh, Dessalines survived uh, independence. He, in some ways, is one of the founders of the nation, one of the most important founders. In the Constitution of 1805, that Dessalines put forth said there's three things in particular that Haiti will do. Haiti will declare everyone constitutionally Black. Haiti will forbid white property ownership. So you can understand the power of that since Africans had been deemed property by law and that Haiti will take the name of the, the indigenous name of the island and adapt that name, make that name the name for, for people, mm -hmm. um, for, the, for the people, uh, Haiti. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's that, that 1804 is when the Haitian revolution triumphs. The constitution is the constitution of 1805. And it is between 1821 and uh, 1844, if not a little bit later, that Monsanto and Plas are producing literature. And so they have to do so under strict Spanish censorship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're doing so in an environment in which they're not allowed to critique the queen, uh, the king, to slander anyone, and certainly not to question the holy faith. Yes. The, the Catholic faith. Yes, it, it seems as though um, in light of all of that, their work or their creations may have been misunderstood, uh, especially nowadays. I'm wondering what it is that you would like to set the record straight about them, um, mm -hmm. uh, given um, everything that you've explained to us. Mm -hmm. Well, with regard to Mansara and Placido, uh, they both have, were really presented as mulatto poets. What you see on your screen here mm -hmm. is a mural um, I don't know the author or the artist, uh, but this mural is in uh, Old Havana. I'm trying to remember the precise plaza. Uh, it's not too far from the Cathedral of Havana, though, I remember. And uh, this mural here is a mural of 19th century Cuban authors. Uh, I believe this woman is G Gomez de Avellaneda. Uh, and these two men on the side, which are standing apart from that white uh, literary coterie, essentially are supposed to be Juan Francisco Manzano here, where my cursor is, and Gabriel de la Concepcion Valdez or Placido, the Martin Delaney-like figure, born free, but who dealt with incredible restrictions on that freedom, right? A contingent freedom that we still struggle with even here in the United States in 2021 as people of African descent. And um, we don't know how either of them look. So these are artists' rendering, artists' uh, renderings. Uh, we know that Placido has been whitened here, that he's said to have been a bit darker than this. Uh, but both of them are described as mulattoes in um, the trial record and by contemporaries. What I wanted to do was to encourage scholars in, uh, in Latin America and even Latino scholars in the United States not to read Manzano and Plaza simply through a racial lens, not to allow the notion of a mulatto identity, this intermediate space in the Caribbean and in Latin America between black and white uh, to determine the way that we read their racial ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and I didn't want it to overdetermine the way that we thought about their cultural identity. So mm -hmm. I looked at religion and spirituality because they're two spheres of cultural activity where people of African descent, free or enslaved, had a bit more room to operate and to move, mm -hmm. uh, in spite of the fact that Catholicism was the official religion of uh, Spanish American colonies. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, from, uh, from essentially the late 15th century or early 16th century, all the way into 1898, into the so-called Spanish-American War, mm -hmm. when, Cuba, Cuba, when Cuba defeats uh, Spain after 30 years of struggle. It, in spite of that, there were some things within Catholicism that created some space for movement and negotiation. Mm -hmm. So if we were thinking about the Yoruba-inspired traditions, for example, right, 
Um, and we think about the Catholic saint, uh, uh, no es sacerdocio, pero es santoral, ¿no? La colección de santos en el catolicismo. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of saints, it's pantheon. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. I'm looking for, essentially. You have this notion that there are intermediates between the divine, between the uh, supreme being, and mm -hmm. between uh, humankind. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a belief in spirits in both cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a belief in, in good and evil, though the beliefs, the, the relationship to good and evil were different. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, it's the insistence on the intermediate spirits that really provides some space for Africans in Cuba and elsewhere in Latin America to associate their divine spirits, their intermediate sp inter intermediary spirits with Catholic saints. And it's that association that in a certain sense saves cultural memory. It preserves cultural memory. And it's the preservation of that cultural memory that made it possible for Manzano and Plaza to make references to the saints uh, that could be read either as references to Catholic saints mm -hmm. or to what the Yoruba inspired uh, traditions call Orishas. Mm -hmm. it, it seems as though uh, one sector of Cuban society could have interpreted their their art in one way, and then another mm -hmm. segment of Cuban society, the Afro-descendant uh, segment, they were receiving all sorts of other different um, symbols, messages, imagery that really spoke to liberation uh, mm -hmm. in, in their own uh, specific way. Um, I'm wondering if you could perhaps um, speak to us a little bit about uh, a topic that I think would be of very great interest in our community, Afro-Latina world, and that would mm -hmm. be um, the depiction of Black women in mm -hmm. uh, especially Placido's work. Mm -hmm. um, we live in a day and age where uh, we're seeing, even most recently, the erasure of Afro-descended mm -hmm. people in mm -hmm. um, artistic works, artistic mm -hmm. creations, and I'd like to know mm -hmm. uh, from you what, what you would have to say or what mm -hmm. your take is on the way that Black women were depicted in the mm -hmm. work of these two 19th century mm -hmm. um, poets. I think that's a really important question, a really important issue. My book is about two two men that that write poetry, that traverse the world, uh, negotiating uh, black manhood in a society that deems them property. They are the property of white Catholic uh, male patriarchs. Uh, in some ways, they're, pop they're a population that's marked for debilitation and destruction. Uh, but at the same time, they are only part of a broader community. Uh, as women of African descent are the other part of that community. And so my book addresses uh, women of African descent as well uh, in a number of different roles. One of the things that I've been working towards in terms of my own thinking about gender theory, uh, and my own engagement with, uh, with feminism and what is now called black male studies is the need for complementarity to think about the masculine and the feminine as natural complements to one another rather than being necessarily in an antagonistic relationship. And that mm -hmm. comes in part from my study of African cosmologies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly the Yoruba cosmologies, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, there, is, uh, there are some non-binary elements uh, within, the, within the way in which the Orishas might manifest. Mm -hmm. So black women, uh, black Cuban women in particular appearing in my book uh, both uh, in the symbolic realm and as historical agents, agents of history. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. To speak about the agents of history very briefly, I would mention Manzano's mother, Maria de Pilar uh, Manzano. Um, Manzano talks about his father with a great deal of respect. He had a difficult relationship with his father. Um, mm -hmm. And he says, you know, he mentions how his father was a man of honor, but his mother really is at the helm. And I think that that speaks perhaps to a matrilineal sense uh, the way in which he understood the family. His mother's mm -hmm. mentioned on the first page of the emancipation narrative or, or slave narrative. He mm -hmm. calls her a woman of reason. Mm -hmm. That's very important because people of African descent were denied uh, an epistemological past. And now the fact that they, have, that they were capable of knowledge production at all. The irony, of course, is that people of African descent, Africans were being brought to the Western hemisphere because of what they knew, because of agricultural knowledge right? Mm -hmm. uh, because of metallurgical knowledge, because of the knowledge of wood carving, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we were, if we, if we, if we think about uh, uh, these sorts of things, if we think about, uh, I don't want to talk about the U.S. too much, but if we think about South Carolina, for example, uh, there's a book by Judith Carney called Black Rice, 
making the argument that it's people of African descent in the Upper Guinea Coast that bring rice cultivation to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. A very convincing, very powerful argument. And women were doing much of that work in West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so black women, right, uh, are historical agents. Uh, in the life of Placido, his mother is actually, was actually a white woman from Burgos, Northern Spain, mm -hmm. a part of Spain not thought to be much influenced by the African Muslim and Arab Muslim uh, influence, but his father was of African descent. Mm -hmm. And um, and he said to have been raised by his black grandmother. We mm -hmm. uh, don't know if she was an enslaved person or not, but he was raised in the extramural neighborhoods, presumably the extramural neighborhoods of uh, of Havana. One of my sources, mm -hmm. uh, Eugenia Maria de Ostos, a Puerto Rican scholar, a white Puerto Rican scholar, uh, says that his mother was uh, also formerly enslaved, which grandmother, excuse me, grandmother was formerly enslaved, which is a possibility. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen other sources to confirm that, but she was significant. So Plasto ends up growing up uh, in the heart of black community. Um, but black women, uh, are important to Plasto's life. Plasto marries women of African descent. He makes that choice as an African descendant of a lighter hue, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, his, uh, he has a series of love poems to a woman by the name of Fela, mm -hmm. uh, Rafaela. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I wrote, wrote about in my dissertation mm -hmm. a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> that I don't I write about in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, in the book, I'm more interested in the ways in which women appear or the divine feminine appear in the symbolic realm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to take a moment here to share again, um, because I do have an image here uh, of a coffee blossom. And I want to talk briefly about a poem that Plaza wrote. I know when we were setting up the interview, te llamó mucho la atención, te gustaba mucho. Esta idea de plástico como la producción estética, la mujer era afro caribeña. What's mm -hmm. interesting, right, about this whole notion of the aesthetic is that uh, Manzano and Placio, um, one scholar argues, uh, are the, the uh, Afro-Caribbean writers that introduce the representation of women of African descent in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Manzano also, you know, has a uh, at least one poem that makes a reference to uh, the beauty of black women. And he, of course, also married black women, mm -hmm. uh, which wouldn't have been surprising for, for the era. Uh, what's interesting about Plasso's work, however, is that the love poetry has a lot more texture. Mm -hmm. There's one poem called The Coffee Blossom. And in this poem, Man uh, Placido uh, constructs essentially a male subject and a female subject. It's mm -hmm. a heterosexual love tryst uh, or a lover's tryst. Mm -hmm. And what you have is you have uh, the male subject essentially beginning, you know, uh, to s try and seduce the woman. And he tries to do so with a language that is uh, very heavily rhetorical, this language of uh, amorous language. And she responds in disbelief. So what's interesting about the poem is, first of all, her response and the nature of her response. She's mm -hmm. incredulous. She doesn't really trust his advances. She's not quite sure. Mm -hmm. And he responds, and he almost seems to be uh, asking her, uh, how do you, questioning her claims to virtue? Like, wait a minute, I think that you, you might be a little bit more familiar, you know, uh, with what it means to be a good lover than you are pretending. And then she comes back and she essentially says that, you know, uh, men always say the same thing. <laughs> and she denies his, she denies his, his advances. And so what I thought was so interesting about this is that uh, the coffee blossom itself as a, becomes a metaphor for the woman of African descent. Mm -hmm. uh, the flower is white, but it produces uh, a brown bean. And so he's talking about the varied hues of women of African descent through metaphor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? He has several poems where he's doing this, right? But it's mm -hmm. also interesting that she has a rhetorical reply. Mm -hmm. that she's not mm -hmm. silent, that unlike yes. romanticism in, uh, in Spain and in Spanish America, the woman is not a silent object of, uh, of male uh, uh, idealization. Yes, yes, uh, definitely uh, an interplay between both male and female, which I also think happens in, um, in African dance as well. It's always a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Almost everything in, uh, in art, creative expression, almost comes out in a conversation as a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Really, really uh, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with mm -hmm. us. Um, it's a wonderful poem. 
mm-hmm. because it's not because there's not a sense of disrespect in my reading. Mm-hmm. There's more so a sense of like where she's kind of saying, "I know you." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And how, how many uh, songs do you remember? This, this conversation, it exists to this day, the way it that does. men uh, it does. interact with each other. It yeah, does. there is that sparring that happens. It's like, yeah, it's a sparring. It's like she's mm-hmm. saying, I know you. And he said, wait a minute, I think I know you too. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm wondering, even though, you know, their, their work um, was created almost 200 years ago, I'm wondering if there's anything that you think we could take away from um, what they created and left behind? Is there anything that we could learn um, from them, um, from their life story or from their works um, that we can take away with us in this day and age? Absolutely. There's actually one more uh, poem that uh, (laughs) uh, I'd like to share in order to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, El poema se llama La Profecía de Cuba, España. The Prophecy from Cuba to Spain. It is one of the most powerful poems, 19th century Spanish American poems mm-hmm. I've ever read. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sharing with you uh, on the screen an image of, uh, of a black woman uh, kind of uh, glaring in a sense at someone off screen, mm-hmm. uh, but doing so in a way that doesn't compromise her concept of beauty, right? Whatever concept mm-hmm. of beauty that she, she possesses. Uh, and this is significant. Uh, the other thing that's significant about the woman that's represented on the screen, on the right of my screen, uh, is the fact that this woman is also uh, wearing a crown of flowers. Both of these things are significant to the poem I want to speak about. Mm-hmm. And then I want to make a couple of, uh, a share essentially the ways in which I think this might be of significance to us today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is also, you'll see here, this is the poem itself as it was published. Uh, this might be from this is probably this is probably this is actually from a posthumous collection of Plasso's work. Uh, Plasso's work was so incredibly political. Not the mo- not most of it, but uh, so many of his poems were political. Uh, that not only was he accused of being the ringleader of a conspiracy to annihilate the white white race, Manzano was also accused of being a part of it. But he was executed as the ringleader. Though I believe that he was one of the leaders. I don't believe he was the architect of the 1844 anti-slavery movement. That's what my research suggested. It was someone else, probably a Haitian fellow by the name of Luis Guigo, but we can't find much on him. Um, mm-hmm. But Placido's poem, The Prophecy from Cuba to Spain, uh, was one of the texts that led the Queen of Spain at the time uh, to say that uh, Placido's name could not be spoken once he had been executed and that his work could not be read by anyone. This is one of the poems that is mentioned in a Spanish newspaper in Madrid after his execution. So what's happening in this poem? What does Plasio do? Plasio uh, had his abiding belief in the power of prophecy. And, and in my reading, uh, I think he's drawing on the language of prophecy coming from the Old Testament. And he's presenting himself as a prophet, similar to the ways in which Nat Turner did in the United States. He has the loyalty oath that he's calling uh, people to swear. And uh, he did actually administer loyalty oaths in real life. So this is something that reflected his actual politics. Uh, He swears before the great God of nature. The language, the gran Dios de la naturaleza, Mm -hmm. uh, makes this akin, in my reading, to the, uh, uh, not the Yoruba inspired, but the West Central African or Bakongo inspired conceptions of nature as the epitome of the sacred. Nature mm-hmm. as a cathedral, as an ab- African tabernacle, as I talk about in the book, a place to get your sacred medicines and to commune with ancestors, uh, a place, a space for ritual, because he could have used, he could have just said Jesus, and he doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. He does not do that. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, the cabildo as an organizing space, that African confraternity, not the Catholic cofradias that lighter skinned uh, Latin Americans went to, right? That, that mm-hmm. the one to demonstrate that they were assimilating into, mm-hmm. right, uh, Spanish American culture. But when Cuba shows up, Cuba shows up like the woman on the right here. Cuba is uh, showing up in a way that is akin to the spirits of Oshun and Yamaya. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cuba is speaking for the rest of the poem. The Queen of Spain doesn't speak. Plaza seeks to speak. And this Afro-Caribbean, I, I, I read her as an Afro-Caribbean because the, the, uh, the flowers on her head 
uh, asares, uh, which is an, a word of Arabic origin, uh, and the flowers that will be found in the south of Spain, the very part of Spain, right, that was conquered by Africans and Arabs. Hmm. Not only by Moroccans, but right. a part of Spain that was conquered by uh, Black Muslims from what is today Mauritania. So wow. the, Sp the Spanish acknowledged uh, that the vast majority of the Almoravids from Mauritania uh, are uh, were, were black people, that the movement no longer exists, but that they were black people. They now acknowledge that. Uh, the foreign ministry released a book that I share with my students uh, to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And what does she say? What does Cuba say? Cuba points, prophesies that Spain will, that the queen will suffer, uh, uh, will be castigated essentially for holding Cuba in captivity. Mm -hmm. That Cuba will rise up like a lion, like an African lion. That Cuba has the wisdom of Osiris. I think it's Os I think it's Isis, not Osiris. I think it's, I believe it's Isis. I forget which which particular uh, Egyptian deity. Mm -hmm. And says that the queen is a slave on the throne, but never a king. So he puts that in the in, in the mouth of of a Afro Caribbean woman. I think that's particularly powerful. Mm -hmm. And for us, I think uh, one of the things that we can hold on to is to first of all think about. Afro-Latino people, Afro-Latinx people, Afro-Latin American people uh, as having not only uh, uh, a history of tragedy with regard to the Atlantic slave trade, uh, a history of colonialism and colonization and domination, uh, but as having a cultural history and an epistemological one, a history of knowledge production. So Plaza becomes an architect of discourse, right? Mm -hmm. and he puts mm -hmm. and he 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 identifies, he identifies he he takes some of what is being given to him right because he's using Roman gods and whatnot, the Mars mm -hmm. god of war in this poem as well. Mm -hmm. So he's taking what's being given with him and he's flipping it on his head. He's mm -hmm. infusing it with, in this case, I believe, a West Central African mm -hmm. uh, meaning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with the great god of nature. Um, and so I think that a lot of it is perspective. Right, mm -hmm. a lot of his perspective mm -hmm. that Africa is a site of knowledge production, and that Afro Latinos and African Americans uh, are uh, somos los herederos. We are the heirs of that knowledge production. We need to get back in touch with that. Okay, um, amazing. Uh, thank you very much for for sharing all of that with us. Um, Yes, I, I do believe that at the end of the day, that is what this wonderful book uh, is, <laughs> is uh, imparting to all of us. I hope that uh, our community looks into this book uh, even more. I'll repeat the name of it again, Cuban Literature in the Age of Black Insurrection. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you can uh, easily find it on Amazon. You can find it at your local um, bookstore even if you request for it, um, it's readily available. And I highly, highly recommend um, that you keep this uh, in your collection of books. So um, I would like to thank you once again for your time and uh, for sharing with us uh, all that you know about this topic. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, I hope that, you know, that there will be more that you'll produce and share with us because uh, definitely um, this is really important uh, for our community to know about. Thank you so, so much. Okay. For the invitation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Take care.